And today we have the pleasure of screening Legacy of Love, the story of how Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott met in Boston. We are very fortunate to be joined by the film's writer and producer and director, CAS alum, Roberto Mighty. And we're gonna hear more from him after the film. And joining him on the panel are three terrific people who, who I'll formally introduce once the film concludes. Dr. Shively Smith, Assistant Professor of New Testament at the BU School of Theology. Dr. Margarita Guillory, Associate Professor of Religion at the College of Arts and Sciences. And finally, Reverend Carrington Moore, Executive Director at Common Cathedral and an outstanding SDH alum. It's really great to see all of you today. And please note that the final 20 minutes of our time together will be reserved for some audience question and answer so that you'll have time to engage the film and the panelists today. So we're, we're really um, delighted to, to hear this documentary where we'll learn aspects of Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott's relationship. We'll learn a little bit about the social gospel and the relevance for today and the importance of Boston. First of all, thank you so much. I'm honored, and thank you so much for, you know, allowing me to be here with this august panel. Really, it's tremendous. I'm feeling very short up here, actually. <laughs> no, just kidding. All. Just kidding. So, um, you know, uh, I was a student here at um, at BU, 1972 to 1976, and in that time, um, we, uh, notably, I fell in love for the first time in my life. Uh, I also um, studied history, and was deeply involved in what was then called the King, well, there was the Martin Luther King Center um, here. So it was a social organization um, run by, financed by the uh, Administration for Students. And um, many of us were involved in things like outreach to incarcerated individuals, you know, people in prison, and um, all sorts of things. And uh, I was not a member of a fraternity, um, but we had various subgroups. All of that, we, ascribed to the civil rights movement and to Dr. King in particular. So many of us are sort of like on the fence, Dr. King, Malcolm X, we don't know. <laughs> but we ascribed all of that, um, our very presence to these incredible heroes. And at that time, I was not aware of women in the movement. So it was really key that later on in my life, uh, I began to understand that this was very important to bring out this story as well. I don't want to talk too much. So uh, that's, I think that's um, probably a good opening. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I love that I actually tend to talk about in class is the power of voice. And so one of the things I love about Coretta Scott King, period, is the recognition that is lost, I think, in the constant just um, Martin Luther King Jr. only, and then sort of putting her as the uh, a second, the appendage, is you miss that she already had voice, that she already had purpose, that she already had a position that actually made a demand on Martin himself. And so one of the things I wanna just say thank you so much about the documentary was to watch it was to go back to the opening pages, the first lines, of Coretta's own memoir, where she, where she says explicitly, some people, a lot of people talk about me as Mrs. King, others know me as Coretta, but before Martin I already had purpose. All right, so, I mean, so these the first two pages of our own memoir, she starts by naming herself as a person who already had voice. So, so, I want to add to this, and my answer is going to be very pragmatic. She's from Alabama. <laughs> what else is there to say? <laughs> um, so you know I'm from Alabama, right? <laughs> no, but seriously, if you look at the geography that she's raised in, um, the film actually brings this up in, in a really powerful way particularly when the film sort of focuses on the different backgrounds that they're from. And Coretta is from Alabama, and I know exactly the part of Alabama that she's from. And in order to survive, even today in Alabama, takes a certain type of discipline, um, intelligence, 
um, the ability to, as we call it in football, have juke moves to navigate, to be very self-aware of yourself and have confidence in yourself. And for me, you know, these are some elements that I really believe attract, that were attractive to him. She was different than probably the women he was sort of courting. And silence, particularly because I grew up in this culture, silence does not mean that you're not powerful. Silence is just the opposite. A person who sits, this is how I was raised. When you sit in silence and you observe, you're actually operating in a, in a sense of power that a person who's always speaking is not operating in. So the fact that she's this wonderful vocalist, but at the same time in her own personal life is able to sit down in silence and just manifest a, a sort of power, powerfulness, why would you not be attractive to that type of individual? Hey Amen. It's great to be with you all today. You all look so beautiful and so handsome. So do a favor, clap it up for yourself this morning. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, um, very honored to be with you all here at the School of Theology and amongst such distinguished professors. And thank you for a wonderful film. My wife and I we watched it a couple of days ago. We we're very blessed uh, to hear about this uh, legacy of love. And in the film, I saw some, some old professors and was having flashbacks of being here at the School of Theology and grateful that one of our senior pastors at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, Dr. Gloria White Hammond is here today, who was also featured in the film. So let's clap it up for Pastor Gloria, amen. <laughs> But this is a great, great question that you ask. Um, you all have already shared so much. I believe Coretta did have a strong sense of purpose, um, partly because I think she grew up in Marion County, Alabama. In many ways, uh, she saw our, our parents' home be burned down uh, by white supremacists. And so when she goes to Antioch College in Ohio, um, she's already participating in social movements, joining the local double NAACP. So she arrives in Boston, there's already a, a dance with the divine, a dance with purpose and destiny that she's already engaged in. I think that's really important for us. And there's a couple of things that are very striking to me about uh, Credit Scott King is not one, one is that she has a strong sense of purpose, but also a strong sense of courage. Uh, when their house was burnt, was bombed, I believe was January 30th, 1967, that in many ways, uh, you know, Daddy King was urging them. He was emphatic, like, you, you all need to move, you need to leave. But Coretta Scott King and Dr. King, they agreed uh, for the sake of the movement that they were going to stay there. And so uh, a lot of her documentaries that, that talk about her, she, you often hear her say, I was not just married to Martin, but I was married to the cause. Um, because she was married to the cause. Uh, her work uh, happened, was going on before she met Martin, because she was married to the cause. She had a strong sense of work ethic and a strong sense of purpose even after the assassination of her husband. Uh, this is a really interesting question in terms of what do I think uh, attracted Martin King to her. Um, I, I think that's a beautiful question. I would simply say, you know, there's a great book uh, by, I believe, Patrick Parr called The Seminarian, um, and it chronicles uh, the life of uh, the coming of age of Dr. King um, while he's at Crozier Theological Seminary. And he actually talks a little bit about his love life. So be prepared when you read it. Like, I didn't know this was going on with Dr. King, but it's a beautiful book. But one of the things it shares is that, uh, that Dr. King, as he's coming of age, trying to navigate through a white theological education, educational institution, but also trying to be practical in how that translates to a very much uh, Southern African American tradition. He has these amazing dialogue partners, chiefly his friends, and even trying to share these thoughts with women that he is dating. And he's, and so in many ways, he has this epistemological algorithm where he's trying to figure out uh, who can dialogue with me to help formulate my thoughts. He has this great poem he would always, uh, he would often say um, to, to kind of describe how he would make meaning of the world with friends that he would often say, or he would have this poem that he would quote, he says, when I looked in the mirror, my reflection I could not see. When I looked to my God, my God eluded me. But when I looked to my brother and my sister, I found all three, I found myself, I found my God and I found my community. And so I think for me, when he, when he stumbles upon uh, Coretta Scott King, to me, I believe he believes that she's his intellectual equal, that she has a way to engage him because again, she already had a strong sense of purpose. And so they're able, he's able to find and engage in meaning making and learn from her in a way that not just helps his own intellectual development, but helps him give a sense of security in his calling and his own destiny. Um, I was struck by the conversation or the tension between 
classes. So we don't, we don't, we don't talk enough, I think, about the class biases and stories that are within people of African descent in America at that time, and sort of the self-selected segregation that we, that's happening and the ways in which we're making different. So they're coming from two different class situations, at least by the time they're in Boston. And then fundamentally, I was so struck by having two fundamentally different Boston experiences initially upon their arrival. And so I wonder to what degree I don't wonder, I, I understand to what degree, again, I like to talk about making a demand that Coretta's own story and experience in terms of these class differences, a social experience, um, continues to, she continues to speak from that and toward that in a way that um, I'm gonna sound very, very professional here, schools Martin over and over again and reminds him of these stories and aren't necessarily fully his in the same way that she's experienced it and what it means to make community across these internal divisions within our own communities is, is something that I think we don't as historians account for enough in that period and we're not talking about enough now even in our current time so I'm, I'm gonna leave it there for now. Um, so let me preface this answer before I get started. Um, I'm not in the School of Theology, and my specialization is Africana religions. I teach very little Christianity. You speak of her dreams. I think of where she was raised. I know the culture. And They are Christians, but <laughs> Christianity, a very nuanced way of practicing Christianity without seeing conflicts. And the documentary alludes to this somewhat and your comments made me think about this, that she was rooted in her faith, but what was her faith? Was it the type of Christianity that we saw happening among black Atlanta, people living in Atlanta? That's a different type of Christianity than the type of Christianity that she would have been raised in in rural Alabama, where you go to church very same as what you would sort of see in Atlanta but you would go home and do some other things that are not necessarily in conflict, but it broadens the type of Christianity that you are practicing. So when we talk about her being rooted in her faith, what type of faith? Um, I'm hard pressed, and this may be another documentary. <laughs> I want to know more about her faith because her faith does not equate necessarily to Dr. King's faith. Because that cultural background that she was raised in made her malleable to all sorts of type of belief systems that can sort of engage and, and, and thicken her faith in her Christianity. This is my belief. This could have been another reason why Dr. King may have been attracted. She had a certain degree of freedom in her religiosity that he might not have had because he was under the thumb. These are, this is real talk now. If you think about black folk in Atlanta, we talk about class and respectability. And she, can't, she did not come from the right family, the right location, picking cotton. I mean, this is not, like class is real in, in the South. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm curious now about her faith and the ways in which her freedom to practice Christianity in particular ways could have also served as an anchor for Dr. King and informed his way of practice. So 
So I, I'm laughing because I say, I go, well, I technically am the gospel scholar here, so I probably should say something about the gospel, Matt. And so there's a couple of things I think that's important that really just builds on this, Dr. Gilroy, is, is the way in which when you are tracking the story of social gospel, t particularly how it is conceived um, as um, how it shows up in King's own work and writing and proclamation. I mean, people always start with King sort of reading himself into the social, reading himself into the social gospel. King himself actually talks about how he first read Rauschenbusch and what that did for him. So King's experience of the social gospel, to use Thurman, was very head oriented in that way. His first encounter was he read it, felt it, and now he begins to work with it, right? A very particular piece. Um, it always strikes me that I wonder, as you talked about, Coretta was already involved in the leftist movement, already involved in social movements. I go, I think that Coretta felt social gospel instead of read it. Like she was feeling it and doing it in a, in a way that I think was very, um, that complemented, um, King's head knowledge and doing that, it was a great compliment in that, in that way. Um, what that means is the social gospel as it begins to be worked out in their collective vocational work in the 50s and 60s, and then I would say on with um, um, Coretta as she continues to institutionalize this legacy and, and expand it, um, means that they while the social gospel movement that King read himself into and then began to work with um, in his sermons and in his own thinking was an adoption, they together began to adapt it. And to me, Coretta is the one who actually act, uh, activates it for this current context in a different kind of way. What does that look like for the gospel to talk to and speak from and be understood with the experience, particularly of people of African descent first in the initially, but then really talking about people on the margins, people dealing with economic struggles, people dealing um, with um, the voicelessness that comes with things such as voter rights being repealed. I mean, that it can, she continues to expand what that kind of reading and more importantly being looks like. That's very important. I'm gonna stay there, just leave it there. <laughs> But I want to talk about the importance of Boston. Boston has always been important. If you, it, it always had a population of free people of color in the city <laughs> that has like legacy. There are some people who are descendants of people from Boston and the surrounding area who were never enslaved. That makes Boston very important with respect to, and they were involved in social justice matters before we called them social justice matter. We called them abolitionist matters then. Boston matters because of geography, because of that legacy. Boston is an epicenter for higher education and it has been for education in general, but particularly for higher education. And Boston has provided opportunities for people of color to get education, formal education. When you come to these places, you build networks. This is what I saw in the film. Of course, it's romantic. They're married, they have children, but they were partners. Boston became a geographical catalyst for them to create a network that was not just them together, but it was a network of them fighting against like social justice causes. So yes, Boston is geography, but Boston is a catalyst for movements, for social movements. It has always been that way, even during the antebellum period. So. Like you say, you found your love too here. So it's, it's like Boston is a catalyst for change. So, I, so, and it's a diaspora within a diaspora. I can say so much about Boston. So let me just stop, even though I'm from Alabama. <laughs>
Amen. This is the point of ref where you're from. I think this is a very uh, interesting question. Um, I'll try to be as honest as possible. You all look trustworthy, so uh, I'll share. I think for me, Boston has the opportunity to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Um, when I watched the documentary, uh, when I was done, I was watching with my wife, I sat there and took some notes. But there was a deep sense of sadness. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's often a desire because it's hard to sit with uh, violence and suffering to make death redemptive. It's part of our faith, you know, that there was a poor melanated Palestinian Jew named Jesus who died from Roman white supremacy and we made it redemptive. Um, and we often need black death or melanated death uh, to help the epistemological reawakening of whiteness. Uh, that we need a Breonna Taylor or a George Floyd to die. So to suggest that we have a racial problem. But Boston, because of we're deeply wealthy and we're resource rich, we have the opportunity to do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so uh, this film is made possible because of your brilliance, but also because of, a, a, I'm assuming, a great black institution that was started in their name called King Boston that is democratically run by black folks. Um, so I think Boston is a pillar because uh, liberation doesn't come, in my humble opinion, through individuals. We often think about the politics of attention. Who has the most attention is the one who is able to set us free. But for me, liberation comes through beautiful black institutions. That's why the AME Church is so important. That's why King Boston is so important. That's why BECMA, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, is so important. This is why the founding of Boston While Black, a space to help young black professionals get together and make meaning. So the building of black institutions in Boston, my hope is that it will, it will be a trickle effect across the country. Because when you have strong black institutions that are able to carry the cultural memory of a people, uh, that builds social and political capital and that allows for liberation to happen. So this is my hope for Boston. I believe that the legacy that Dr. King and Credit Scott King has left, I think that's a way that we push it forward. I have a question, Brother Mighty. I would like to hear you to share with us how your vision, your understanding, your perspective of Boston has changed or was fiddled with as a result of doing this documentary. So filmmakers like to plant what we call Easter eggs in films. And so these are little things which not everyone's going to notice, but the people who want to notice them will notice them. So um, again, I didn't make this happen. I was just there to film it. So there's a, um, a moment when you see Reverend Willie Broderick addressing a group of people at, at, at his church. And um, did you notice who was on that dais with him? There was Ken Janey. There was Rachel Rollins. Uh, there was Ayanna Presley. And there, and in the art, I was there, obviously, in the, in the audience, there were all these other folks. And at the end of the film, you see our great Boston leadership, our great, our current Boston leadership, including, uh, you know, two people who happen to be in this room. Thank you so much, again, for your participation and your wisdom. Um, but also you saw, and I heard someone say, city councilor, Wu, city councilor. And there are several other folks, and I really insisted on getting folks from all religions because when, Coretta and King marched together, they made it a point to include people of all extant religions. And when I visited those people at, for two years before filming them, um, they said, oh yeah, you ought to talk to so-and-so. He's in California now, but he marched with Dr. King. And, oh, you ought to, and these are, again, of all faiths. So I just wanted to sort of have that as a roundabout response. As far as my impressions of Boston are concerned, well, you know, I'm, um, I love Boston. And I hope, again, plenty of Easter eggs in there. You see, you know, these beautiful places. A lot of physical beauty here in Boston. And, and I think, as you pointed out, um, great, all of you say great Black institutions and a great heritage. But also, it's a place where there has been this, this um, you know, glass ceiling um, for African American people of African descent in general. And it's, it's tough because it's, you know, I I've often hear my you know, loved ones from the South saying, oh, you don't understand, you keep saying we're segregated, well, y'all just are segregated. You know, you just don't realize it. And so, you know, you hear this a lot, right? And it's true. So the, it causes me deep concern to see, you know, um, this issue about people of color, particularly African-Americans, 
somehow not being able to rise above certain levels. And this just continues and continues and continues. Now, of course, there's, I hear murmurs of assent in the audience. Now, I, I hear, you know, um, we can always point to some special unusual person. Oh, well, well what about so-and-so? What about Barack Obama? You know, um, but this is a continuing problem um, such that, um, you know, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it right there. 